Welcome to B5, Growth and Development. So we look at four main areas. The first one is how organisms develop. The second one is stem cells, which relates to the first one. The third one is how plants grow and develop. And the fourth one is about how DNA is used to make mRNA, which then is um, used to form proteins. So here is either a unicellular organism, or we could call it a single cell from a multicellular organism. Um, and if I draw a number of these cells, um, essentially if they're the same cell, then we can call this a tissue. So a tissue is a group of the same cells working together. You can't use the word similar cells because they must be the same cell for it to be a tissue. And they perform a certain function. Now these different tissues can come together and different tissues can come together to form an organ, such as this kidney, other organs could be the lungs and heart and so on. And they're made of different tissues all working together to carry out a certain function. So a kidney, for example, will create urine to get rid of urea as a waste product. The heart will pump the blood and so on. And different tissues work together. Now, different organs can work together to make organ systems, such as the respiratory system and so on. So this um, single cell there can be formed by a sperm and egg cell coming together to form a zygote. And in this case, a zygote is essentially a stem cell, and it can divide and grow by uh, mitosis to form clones of itself. And that starts to bunch together to form an embryo. So an embryo is a bunch of cells um, early in, in development inside the mother's uterus. And as these cells grow and divide, eventually they start specializing. So here is an example of a specialized cell, um, not a zygote and not a stem cell. This would be a neuron. Now, to make a, a specialized cell, um, certain genes inside the cell, or inside the nucleus, are switched on. And if those genes are switched on, certain proteins are made, which creates a specialized cell. Now, that could specialize into either a neuron, as we saw, um, or other types of cells. Now, embryonic stem cells are the stem cells found in embryos before a um, fetus is essentially grown into a baby. And these can grow into all types of cells. So they can grow into, as we said, heart cells, um, skin cells, and so on. Now, adult stem cells are found in um, newly born children and adults as well, not just adults. And they can only really form into a few types of cells. So for example, in your long bones, in your femur, for example, in your leg, um, there are adult stem cells that can change into either red blood cells or white blood cells. They couldn't become neurons, they couldn't become skin cells, they can only really form into a few types of cells. So it's better to use embryonic stem cells for research than adult stem cells. Now plants also have stem cells. Here I'm drawing um, essentially a number of cells together. The red part there is what we call lignin, so the water lignified and waterproofed. And this is a xylem vessel. So the xylem will carry water and minerals up the plant, not downwards. And it's made of dead cells, so that waterproofing of the cells kills the cell and leaves a hollow tube for water to go up. Whereas on the right hand side, I'm drawing this phloem, and phloem is made of living cells, and it can carry sugars, such as sucrose, and amino acids up and down the plant. And um, essentially in the middle there, I've drawn the meristem, which is made of stem cells, which can grow into either xylem or phloem. Now I'm also going to draw another cell. This is called a palisade cell, and this contains chloroplasts, um, which aid in photosynthesis, as well as other key parts here, which I'll label. So, first of all, that is the cell wall. The cell membrane's there, the nucleus, chloroplasts, which contain the pigment chlorophyll, and the vacuole, and the cytoplasm, which is the liquid inside it. And that palisade cell is important for photosynthesis and the meristem can also grow into a palisade cell if it's placed next to one. So xylem, phloem and palisade cells are all made um, and essentially they can make up tissues of the plant and those tissues are put together to make an organ. So an organ could be a leaf or a stem or roots and they are parts of a plant that contain different types of tissues made from xylem, phloem, and, and um, palisade cells. So now we're going to look at different ways of growing plants. The first way is a simple plant cutting. So you can take any old plant um, and take, usually a pair of scissors is fine, and take a, a small cut of a plant, a few centimetres wide, and um, that's called a cutting. 
And if you dip that cutting into what we call rooting powder, um, made of certain chemicals which, which stimulate growth, um, what will happen is that will coat the, the plant and you can then plant it into compost and within a few weeks it will grow into a plant. And it's important to know the plant that you grow is the exact same type of plant as the one you cut from. So it's a clone. So you've made a clone of a plant using part of a shoot which you've cut off and implanted. It's probably the most simple method of, of growing a new plant um, and it's generally fairly easy but of course there are problems with, with how long this takes and how many plants you can grow. A second method is called a tissue culture. So you can take an even smaller cut of either a leaf or a root and we're talking you know a, a few hundred cells or so and then what you do is you put these cells into a solution containing enzymes and the enzymes will actually start to break down the um, inter intercellular proteins and separate those cells outwards um, so that you can actually get different types of cells sedimented. So once you've broken the cells apart, you can then select the cells you want to grow, usually the mirror stem cells, the, the, which are the stem cells of course. So you take those stem cells and what you do is you put one stem cell or one mirror stem cell into one agar plate filled with a nutrient jelly and that contains all the minerals and amino acids and so on the plant will need for growth and that one cell will have enough nutrients and minerals to grow and it will start to develop into these tiny seedlings which essentially um, are small plants that eventually are large enough um, to plant into compost once they've grown a root so now you can plant these seedlings into compost and now you've got of course many more plants than the simple um, cutting method. So tissue culturing is really fast. You can make millions or hundreds of thousands of plants in one factory um, in a much quicker time and you can make it much cheaper as a process. So for you know places where there's food shortages it's a very effective process but of course the problem with these two methods are you create clones so you reduce the biodiversity. You're not, you're not really um, changing the genes. So there's a risk that viruses and so on can kill many plants at once. So let's look how auxins work then. So auxins are plant hormones and they're responsible for plant growth. So if I draw a plant here, I can show you that plants tend to grow towards the light. So we call them phototropic. So they have phototropism and they all grow towards the light. Now shoots like the stem, grow towards the light, whereas roots tend to grow in the opposite direction to light. So if it goes towards the light, it's called positively phototropic. And of course, it's called negatively phototropic in the roots when it goes away from the light. So how does this work then? How does a plant respond to light? If I draw you a shoot there, I'm also going to draw some light coming from the right-hand side. And that is showing you the direction of a chemical made in the shoot called auxin which is a growth hormone and the auxin spreads across the side of the plant that's not in direct contact with light so it goes to the dark side of the plant um, and this is how it works if i draw a normal plant cell and then an enlarged plant cell it shows you that auxin will stimulate plant growth to elongate those cells so those three cells have essentially all elongated making that part of the plant grow so when auxin um, connects to the left hand side of the plant the left hand side grows a lot faster than the right hand side meaning the plant kind of curves to the right and grows towards the light and that's how phototropism works so let's now look at um, growth in animals and in plants so there are two types of cell growth and division one is mitosis and one is meiosis now if i look inside the cell i drew earlier um, we can see that it has 46 chromosomes, which is basically 23 pairs, as chromosomes usually come in pairs. So, 46 chromosomes in mitosis in a cell will split into two cells, each containing 46 chromosomes. So essentially, one parent cell creates two identical clones of itself, each having 46 chromosomes. So let's find out how that happens. So first of all, I'm drawing the nucleus of the first cell, the, the parent cell, and I'm drawing a couple of those chromosomes that you would find. Not, I'm not drawing all, all 46 there, I've just drawn four. So the first stage of mitosis is where the chromosomes are replicated um, and essentially copies are made which are identical 
to the chromosomes they start off with. So 46 becomes um, 92 chromosomes in that cell. Then what happens is those 92 chromosomes separate. So 46 go in one part of the nucleus and 46 go in the other. And the nucleus tends to pinch off, separating itself into two genetically identical cells, each of them having 46 chromosomes. Now, if you didn't copy those chromosomes in the first place and you simply just half the cell, then you'd have 23 chromosomes per cell and that wouldn't be a functional adult um, diploid cell. Now, meiosis is a different process. It's where 46 chromosomes in one cell somehow separate out to form four cells, each having 23 chromosomes. And if you think about it, um, 23 times 4 is 92. So what needs to happen is, just like in mitosis, um, those chromosomes double up and they're copied and the identical copies are made. But rather than um, division into simply two cells, which happens first of all, you get two divisions. The first division creates two cells, each being identical to the parent cell, having 46 chromosomes each. And they then divide straight away again, forming four cells. And those four cells each have half of 46 chromosomes. So each, half, each cell now has 23 chromosomes. So mitosis happens to copy cells um, to make two daughter cells. And that happens usually in repair, whereas meiosis happens to create four haploid cells, and each of those cells has half the number of chromosomes as a normal cell or a diploid cell. Um, and that generally happens during sexual reproduction. So meiosis only really happens in the genital parts of men and uh, women and humans. Um, or of course, when you when you look at plants, you've got the the idea of the ova produced and the pollen. So those twenty three which are basically in human sperm and eggs, can recombine to form um, a number of different possibilities. And depending on how they recombine, um, the babies that are produced would have different genetic information to the, to the parents. And that's why, you know, sexual reproduction produces um, non-cloned animals or plants. So if we have a baby, it tends to be a bit different to the mum and dad because those, those genes have reshuffled during the process of mitosis, sorry, meiosis, which then creates um, the sperm and egg, which recombine together during fertilization. So now let's look at DNA. So DNA has a number of parts. It has the green part there, which is called the phosphate group. And that phosphate is joined to that hex, so that pentagon, sorry. And that pentagon is called a ribose or five carbon sugar. And if you see that zigzag form, each phosphate is joined to a sugar, joined to the next phosphate, joined to a sugar, and so on, in a polymer chain going downwards, and that's called the sugar phosphate DNA backbone. And in DNA, you have two backbones, uh, one of which I'll draw in a minute. And to the right-hand side, um, the A, T, C, and G I've drawn stands for adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and they're called the bases. So you've got the, the phosphate sugar backbone, and joining those are bases, A, T, C, and G. And those bases are complementary. So A, adenine, only binds to T, thymine. And C, cytosine, only binds to G. So A to T and C to G. And if I draw the second backbone there now, you can see that essentially what we call a DNA ladder. So it forms a ladder. And that highlighted part there is called a nucleotide. So a nucleotide is made up of one base, one pentosugar, and one phosphate. So if I draw a simplified structure of DNA there in 2D, trying to show 3D, you've got those two uh, DNA sugar phosphate backbones cored around in a double helix and joined together by those bases. So let's see how DNA is used to make proteins. So first of all, the first step is called transcription, and it happens in the nucleus of a cell. It doesn't happen anywhere else but the nucleus. And this is how it happens. So in the nucleus, you have DNA. And you also got nuclear pores, which are small holes um, joining the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And the DNA cannot move through those pores, mainly due to A size and B charge. So what happens is, inside the nucleus, the DNA unzips, and that's a fine word to use in GCSE, and it exposes those bases. So A is no, no longer paired to T, and C is no longer paired to G. So, um, in the nucleus, there are also some free-floating bases, or free-floating nucleotides, which have bases, and those start to move towards those unpaired bases in the DNA, which have now broken apart, or unzipped, by electrostatic forces. 
So now, on those two strands of DNA, or two um, backbones, you get two new strands forming, which are complementary to the template strands they're built from. And I'm showing you an example of that building up now. And that's called an mRNA strand, or a messenger RNA strand. And it's basically um, simplified, you can call it a, a kind of like a copy of DNA. But it's one strand rather than two, so it's a lot smaller, and it has a different charge, so it can move freely through those nuclear pores now. So you can get inside the um, cytoplasm outside the nucleus. And this is where the second stage of protein synthesis happens, and this second stage is called translation. So transcription, stage one, happens in the nucleus to make mRNA from DNA. And now stage two, translation, happens in the cytoplasm, and it's now where we're going to try and make the protein. And step two is shown there in the cytoplasm. So the mRNA leaves the, the nucleus, goes to the cytoplasm, and in the cytoplasm it will bind onto a ribosome, uh, which is found on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And I'm showing you some base letters there, A, U, C, A, G, U, C, and so on. Now, I did say earlier um, that U replaces T, so you don't have to remember that for the exam, it's only G, C, C. But at A level, you would have to know that uracil or U replaces T or thymine in mRNA. So it binds onto a ribosome in the cytoplasm. And these structures called tRNA or transfer RNA um, have bases too. And it carries amino acids. So different types of tRNA carry different amino acids. And those letters there, um, AGI I'm, I'm showing there, are actually um, complementary bases which bind onto the mRNA. So each three-letter code of the bases on the mRNA is called a codon, and it codes for a specific tRNA carrying a specific amino acid. And every time three letters are read, or three bases are read, a new amino acid is placed in that chain, called a polypeptide chain, and eventually that chain is so long it becomes a protein. So remember the amino acids in that chain, showed with those different colours, are built up into a longer and longer length to make a protein. And the order of those amino acids is, is defined by the order of the bases on the mRNA. So really, the mRNA is made from DNA, and essentially it carries the code to tell the tRNA molecules how to place the amino acids in the right order to make certain proteins.